Welcome back to another Theology Applied episode. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. In this episode, I am welcoming the CEO of Armored Republic, Mr. David Reese. He's also a local pastor. We're talking about civic covenanting, ecclesiastical covenanting. Basically, to break it down, we get very practical. Theological terms will be included, but so will definitions and explanations and practical marching orders applications, takeaways, things that we can do, the average Christian on the ground. But basically, this is it. We want a theological maximalism and unity. And not just unity of common care. Hey, we disagree, but we still love each other. No, a unity of common conviction. Uh, We're united, not just because we tolerate one another in the midst of disagreement, but we're united because we're actually achieving the knowledge of the faith the knowledge, the same knowledge of the Son of God. In Ephesians 4, unity of common conviction, unity of knowledge, not just a unity of common care, but a unity of common conviction. So a lot of what evangelicalism has done over the last 50 years and even longer is a theological minimalism, lowering the bar doctrinally as low as we can get because, well, doctrine divides and we need to be united. And the only way to be united is to stop caring about truth or to care about a lot less truth. But is there a way from the scripture? Does God give us a method, a strategy for being united and not lowering the bar theologically? I think there is. Mr. Reese thinks there is. And that's what we're going to lay out for you today. Applying God's word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. All right, welcome to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. In this episode, I'm welcoming back to the show Mr. David Reese. He is the CEO of Armored Republic. He's also a local pastor. And we're going to be discussing balkanization, division, and also unity. Uh, truth unites. It also divides. Um, but there is, there's got to be some kind of uh, stopping measure. Um, we we want truth matters, um, but we don't want to unnecessarily divide over the most minute uh, expressions of tertiary truths. And uh, right now, it seems like in the evangelical world uh, that we are fracturing and splintering further and further and further. And um, when brothers dwell in unity together, it's pleasing to the Lord and God hates division. And so um, we're trying to think of ways Uh, and offer some practical principles in this episode for uh, what things are worth dividing over, what things are not worth dividing over, and how can I ensure that the people that I align with today, uh, that I'm not their enemies uh, 15 minutes from now. I think a lot of us, you know, in the the woke wars 1.0 of 2020, uh, we had a lot of uh, co-belligerence and a lot of guys that we would have said are on the team. And it hasn't been that long in just a few short years from 2020, uh, guys who we would have said initially were all on the same team. uh, Now we find ourselves splintered and fractured. Um, So at at a certain point, that's got to stop. Otherwise, uh, yes, we are Protestants, but we don't want uh, every individual Protestant to just be his own Pope. So Mr. Reese, what do we do about that? Thanks for having me on, brother. So I think that what we have to do is we have to realize that there are different rallying points for unity. And there's the rallying point for the state, there's the rallying point for the church, for the household, and then for the individual. And so I think that thinking about these different covenant spheres and how they're supposed to think about functional unity um, is is key. And so, you know, we we are Americans, and so we're very used to thinking about the individual operating just sort of atomistically. And so we go, okay, so the goal is to glorify God. Great. So now we have we have a we have a joint, you know. North Star. We have a we have a target that we're ultimately getting to. It's a few light years away, but we're gonna we're gonna be moving there. Uh, and so then you have sort of this. Okay, the law of God is the means by which we're supposed to get moving towards that that target. Um, and so, in addition to that, we we kind of go. Okay, so that's what we're supposed to do. But but matters of preference, you're supposed to be able to do all sorts of things. And and we just think about the individual. And so we we forget that that individuals are supposed to be cooperating inside of the other covenant institutions. And so we've spent time talking about the household and how the household functions well. And so if individuals are in covenant with God, they're supposed to glorify God, then we go, okay, how do we interact with other people? And the principal places are the household, the church, and the state. So with the household, you know, you're looking for extreme unity, right? Because, you know, you think about this, if you're, if you're a man, you're looking to, to lead somebody and have her be your helpmeet. 
for the rest of your life. And she's going to have to be able to deal with you in, in all sorts of details and be able to submit to you in enormous detail. Um, and so, and a wife is looking for, you know, you're, you're looking for a godly man, but you're, you're choosing a boss, right? And so, right. so this idea that you, you've got to pick a man that you think has good character, uh, that has good doctrine, and that you feel like you're able to resolve conflicts in a way that is ultimately going to go appealing back to the Word of God. And you've got the church to protect you in terms of there being, you know, abuses or whatever. But the state, I mean, you know, a man can be unfaithful or a woman can be unfaithful and then just leave with half the stuff. Right. You know, and, and so so the church is sort of the only public protector we've got there right now. But so choosing well in marriage and raising your children, you have all sorts of room for you know, ordering your children to fulfill preferences. Right. So there's there's a way the household sort of becomes a place where you're training unity and you're training you know, obedience and you're training operational unity and where you have more minute detail. And then you can pay people to do work inside of the household and, you know, they, if they want to keep taking the money, then they've got to keep obeying in detail, right? So that's sort of, the unity is easier to obtain there. What we find is when we move to the church, when we move to the state, we start to have a lot more fracturing uh, and it's difficult. Um, and people tend to either kind of try to make the church like the household or the state like the household, or they try to make the household like one of those higher institutions and, and then you don't have efficient management. So right. we need to recognize there's a different form of government, generally speaking, uh, in, in the lower governments than in the higher governments, right? When you, as an individual, it's monarchy, you're governing yourself. In the household, you've got essentially a monarchy where the, ha the patriarch is ruling the home. And, but then you get to the church and you've got a monarchy in the form of Christ as the king of the church, but there's a supposed to be plurality of elders, there's supposed to be you know, this ability to, to deal with the removal of officers and all that kind of stuff, right? So you've got, you've got this, this issue of there's sort of a more of a power struggle that could occur and there's less centralized power. And with the state, you know, even though you can have a um, you could have a monarchy that is a valid government that you know God Himself appointed generally a republican form of government, and those things are are uh, they have different tendencies. But you you're going to have a hard time even with the absolute monarchy. There's a difficulty of of knowing what's actually going on. The tendency of absolute monarchs is to start delegating out everything to a bunch of different bureaucrats, and they don't even know what's going on. It's kind of like in the Book of Esther, where Haman has ordered the genocide of the Jews, and you know Darius uh, Hashuerus, the emperor Darius, he he doesn't even really know who's been executed, who's been ordered to be executed, and he finds out his wife is one of those people, right. and then he finds out that there's been this general order of, of of genocide, and he goes, oh oh, this is a problem. Like that's the level of disconnect that even an absolute monarch you can have from 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 having to manage a large realm right so i think that what we're talking about principally today is unity in the church and unity in the state and getting rallying points for that yep. and so i want to i want to suggest that the rallying point uh in the church in in short form is, is covenanting around some sort of unity that's defined and the same is in the state and those don't have to be the exact same covenant i think ideally they would be but i think that the reality is that in a church, you have to have more unity than, than you have to in the state. And eventually, the goal would be to see this idea of a covenanted uniformity, where you have unity in doctrine, but you then capture that in a form, an external form. And that external form is called the confession. Mm. And then that you also have an external form that's the, the form of government of the church and the form of worship that's going to be dealt with. And in the state, you have similarly a, a constitution for the state. And so these are the things that are, that are getting worked out. And so in the interim, the question is, how do we, what are the intermediate steps to advance towards those goals? So I'd be curious, you know, if you, if you have uh, disagreements with those perspectives on the, on the no. goals and the rallying points. No, so far I agree. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's important in the church and with the state um, in both of those realms is just um, triage, you know, so in the church, you know, a theological triage of saying, uh, you know, what, what must one believe, what should one believe and what may one believe, um, you know, you must believe this in order to be, you know, a member of this church, uh, you should believe this. Um, although, uh, it may be a, an arena where we leave room for some degree of disagreement. Um, but you know, but we still have a position that we think is right. We're not relativists. You should believe this. And then there may be uh, other areas where it's like, well, th this is something that you may believe, but not necessarily even should believe. Um, so must and should and may, uh, theological triage, 
um, so that there, so that so that you can have unity, um, but you know, unity with hopefully more than just you know four people. Uh, that you know that it's we're not so particular in our covenanting together that uh, that all of our covenants are um, inherently small. That it's just this this very very small group of people people that align on everything. Um, and then, you know, and then you just, you keep fracturing and keep fracturing and keep fracturing. Yeah. So I think that when we look at the history of the church and we look at what the scriptures teach about the idea of how the church deals with things, there has to be, there has to be an authoritative distinguisher between, you know, what we have to covenant around versus not. And so if you divorce the church from any history, and you don't say that there's any covenants that have ever been reached before, then you can sort of just say, well, we're just going to make up a new one that we think kind of meets the minimum bounds of maybe a Christian. And then you can say, maybe we're going to have some definition for what we think is acceptable for our officers. And then we're going to have sort of a definition that we think could be maybe other officers that we could unite with, even though we're not in part of the same same church. So, right. but I want to suggest that covenants are binding across generations. And so if that's the case, if covenants are binding across generations, then we, whether we find it convenient or not, may have to think about covenants that have been reached before or, or decisions of the church that might have been reached before. So, and we also have to ask ourselves, is there a cumulative work that's been done? Or is this sort of this chaos hodgepodge where everybody has to like study everything that's ever happened from the first century forward and and kind of piece it all together. Right. So to, to cut to the chase on that, I mean, what I want to communicate is essentially, I would suggest that the Reformation reached a new high water mark, and that there's a rallying point that's defined there. And so whether you're if you're Baptist, you're basically going to say the London Baptist Confession is the high water mark. If you're Congregationalist, you're going to say the Savoy Declaration, and if you're Presbyterian, you're going to say the Westminster Confession. And right. you look at those documents. They agree about basically everything except for baptism and church government. Right. And so the idea that it's not possible to get to significant doctrinal unity is something that I just say, that's not the case. I mean, that's not, the Holy yeah. Spirit simply does it. So the Holy Spirit does that. So the right preaching of the word, careful guarding of those things. And so I want to suggest that on an institutional level, we need to rally to, as churches, a confessional standard. And then as we disagree, so like in your case, being Baptist, in my case, being Presbyterian, our job becomes arguing with each other about those disagreements to where we can come to unity. Right. So one of us is wrong. Right. And, and so either children need to be baptized or they don't. And so I can deal with you as a brother and as a friend and say, Hey, let's, let's, let's talk about other stuff. We can do other things. And then we have to keep coming back to the point of disagreement. Right. And, and the goal is, is not simply to, to keep re-saying the same things exactly. But the goal is to say, okay, here are the verses. Let's let's talk through them. Let's work through them. Let's work through the points of disagreement on those. So you go back to the to the scriptures itself. So this, I think, a commitment to seeking unity, not just not just seeking to shut up, right? But but seeking to actually come to agreement. Mm -hmm. Um and that that happens while arguing with each other. And right. it, I think a lot of the times you know, the problem is that we're impatient with each other. And we say, if I've talked to this person about this doctrine you know, once or twice, you know, I'm just not going to talk to them about it anymore, or I'm going to not be their friend anymore, or whatever. And so you go, the, the, this, this stuff that is not the gospel proper, if we're not in some sort of a church covenant together, then we can still be pushing to try to come to resolution on those things. So right. I, think, I think the confessional standard is what we have to use to, to say that. And so a lot of people are going to say that Westminster Confession or the London Baptist Confession is too long. There's too much detail there. Hmm. And so I think they're going to, they're going to criticize that as, as too detailed. So I, what, what do you think about those as the, the points to rally around? I think that's good. Um, I, you know, w one, I, I think there's um, a misunderstanding of unity. So I think that's part of the hang up is um, the Bible actually speaks to at least two different types of unity. Because when we think unity, I think that we've been... Um, we've been indoctrinated uh, with a light, fluffy, watered down Christianity uh, that, you know, anytime it discusses unity, it's only talking about one kind of unity, which is a biblical unity, but even that 
um, has been perverted. And so the type of unity in in ninety nine point nine percent of sermons that you know that discuss unity, uh, the type of unity in view is what I would call um, a unity of love, or you could put it another way, you could say a unity of common care. Um, so this would be the type of unity that um, that insists in Scripture that we should bear with the weak, um, that we should um, exercise charity towards one another in the midst of disagreement. Um, and that is biblical. There, there is a biblical precedent for that type of unity. The problem is not that that type of unity is wrong. Um, the problem is that there's more than one type of unity. Ephesians 4 is probably one of the premier chapters that speaks about not a unity of love or common care, but rather a, a unity of the faith or a unity of the knowledge of the faith, which is a unity of common, not care, but common conviction. Um, Ephesians 4, uh, what's being asserted there is that one, Christ is the head of the church, and as a good head, he gives gifts to the church in the form of leaders. Leaders are not a burden, but good leaders is the ideal, and they should be viewed as a blessing, a gift to the church. Christ gives different kinds of, of leaders, and I would say not just different kinds of leaders for different roles and tasks, but also different stages of this church-building project. So he gives Ephesians 2.20, cross-referencing that from Ephesians 4, he gives apostles and prophets for leg one. Um, that, you know, if we're thinking of a construction team, um, it's not just that the same men um, are working from the project from start to finish, but there are uh, different teams of men who are particularly skilled in different forms of labor. And, uh, and one team of men, namely those who lay a foundation, they come first. Uh, and then when the foundation is uh, firmly laid, uh, then we don't need to do that part of the the house building project over again, and uh, we don't uh, we don't need those men. We still need their foundation. We need their work that's already been done, but we don't need those men. So we we Absolutely. still have the foundation, which is I would say that it's the apostles and prophets in scripture rated. Um, so we still have the apostles and prophets. We still have their work. But we don't still have modern day apostles and prophets working, but we still have the work of the apostles uh, and prophets. And it's a work that was good. It's a sufficient work. It's a perfect work um, inspired by the Holy Spirit with Christ himself as the capstone. And so it's a work that we don't need to do over. And now you have evangelists and, you know, shepherds, teachers coming in. And I think that's, you know, uh, where, who, who is working now. And there's some debate to be had. Maybe evangelists are a second wave, and, and now it's shepherd teachers in the last wave. So whether it's two waves, two stages of the work, or three, um, the, you know, and whether it's a five-fold ministry or a four-fold ministry that shepherds and teachers are two sides of one coin, um, that there's debate for that. It's but two the, phases and there's four offices. You're, right. you're good. <laughs> two phases and four offices. Um, that That's my view, uh, believe it or not. And so, um, so that being said, um, I think that that's uh, really helpful for people to realize. But here's the big point. So Jesus is the head of the church. He gives gifts to the church in the form of men, leaders, qualified leaders for two separate waves, stages of this work. Um, all building one project. We're not building two different, it's not two different projects. It's not two different uh, houses. It's one house in two stages. Uh, we need to know what stage we're on now so that we're not trying to, so that we're actually framing walls and not taking a jackhammer and trying to undo a foundation. No, that's done and it's good. And then the last thing is, what is the chief aim, the, the, the ultimate purpose, the goal? And the goal is not unity of common care. It's not unity of charity in the midst of disagreement. No, the goal is so that we would achieve a unity of faith, the same knowledge of the same Son of God. Not, well, I think Jesus looks like this, and I think Jesus looks like that, but we love each other and, and we'll tolerate each other nonetheless. That is nowhere in view with the type of unity being discussed in Ephesians 4. It's not a unity of common uh, care or love. It's a unity of knowledge, faith, common conviction, so that we would no longer be like children tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine, but we would actually grow up into the fullness of the maturity of Christ. And Christ is not bipolar. Christ is not uh, uh, schizophrenic. He doesn't have multiple personality disorder. Christ is one person, and so too his body should be one body uh, that is not merely held together by love, but held together by agreement. And, and so I, I even wrote part of that in, in my book. I wrote a whole chapter saying, a unity of common care 
right? Toleration of one another, charity towards one another in the midst of disagreement is good. Uh, but let us never forget that the first, uh, the first kind of unity, the best kind of unity that we're aiming for um, is not that we're united uh, merely through love in the midst of disagreement, but we're actually united because we agree. And the way that we get there is not um, through uh, tolerance. The way we get there is through persuasion. Right Response Ministries 2025 conference is a go. This is three days, full jam-packed conference with eight main sessions, three to four hour and a half long panels, and an all-star super based lineup of speakers, 15 speakers in all. Who are they? Steve Dace, Jeff Durbin, Orrin McIntyre, Stephen Wolf, Brian Sovey, Andrew Isker, John Harris, Eric Kahn, A.D. Robles, Dan Burkholder, the Christian Prince himself, Dusty Devers, Ben Garrett, Zachary Garris, David Reese, and yours truly, Pastor Joel Webin. Again, this is April 3rd, 4th, and 5th. 2025 and the early registration is open right now. This is the longest conference with the most speakers we've ever offered and yet it is our all-time lowest price. The early registration available today is only 140 bucks for an adult. So go to rightresponseconference.com. Again, that is rightresponseconference.com to register right now because the early registration will not last long. Are you desiring to change your financial trajectory and build multi-generational wealth for your children and grandchildren? Our sponsor, Private Family Banking Partners, invites you to join a growing number of like-minded individuals, families, and entrepreneurs who are working together to form a unique part of the parallel economy. Are you concerned about preserving your retirement savings tucked away in your 401k? With personal income tax rates likely to be much higher after 2026, now may be the best time to borrow or withdraw your 401k savings to fund your privatized banking system. For many families, this may be a powerful wealth preservation hack, even with a 10% early withdrawal penalty. For others, a tax-free and penalty-free 401k or 403b rollover may be a great option. With private family banking, you will learn how to establish a privatized banking system that will increase the value of the money and savings that you already have flowing through your life. Join this growing community today as a part of putting Post Mill Talk into Post Mill Action by contacting a private family banking partner today by emailing them at banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Again, that's banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Also see the show notes below to schedule a discovery call and get a free copy of the ebook, Protect Your Money Now, How to Build Multi-Generational Wealth Outside of Wall Street and Avoid the Coming Banking meltdown. Uh, that's excellent. I, I agree with everything you said there. And I, I think that the idea that we begin with, we have this, we have this unity of care in order to get to the unity of exactly. the faith. So that the conversations and persuasion have the relational context to keep happening. Absolutely. And so I think that exactly right. So we, we, we care, we care for each other in that way in order to make it so that we can keep discussing. So we're removing as many offenses as we can. So that the offense of disagreement is the thing that's there is the focus. So the goal is to close it out. You know, in manufacturing, uh, you talk about the idea of, of work in progress. And work in progress is a really dangerous thing because you just end up with all this. You got raw material inventory. You take it in. You make it work in progress. It's been altered. It can't be made into something else now. So you have all the in illiquidity. You, you can't turn it into something different that you would have if it were a finished product. But you have none of the value of a finished product. Right. And so the finished product is valuable because you can sell it. The, 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 the raw material is valuable because it's able to be turned into all sorts of stuff. And, and the, the stuff that's work in progress has all of the negatives of both and right. none of the positives of either. <laughs> and mm. so, and so it's when you have disagreements, it's sort of work in progress. And I think the goal has to be between Christians to seek to limit the work in progress. We don't try to bring up everything under the sun that we can think of that we might disagree about, but instead your goal is to find you know, find unity, have a common care, and to then seek to resolve disagreements by seeking to be careful and self-controlled. Right. And I think some people um, who like to debate, I think a lot of people who are really gifted in a prophetic way 
just like to debate. And they go and they want to debate with people whether they're mature or not. And because those people haven't matured into a place of, of being careful about what disputes they're opening up, they sort of end up making strife all over the place. And we, you know, we could joke about this as the cage stage, which is basically people who care about doctrine coming to realize some important doctrine and then realizing they want to debate about that. And then they learn about other neat things that matter in the Bible and sort of debate about those. Right. So I think one of the really important things for pursuing unity is recognizing what you talked about as the unity of care um, and the unity of love. But then using those things to help to resolve disputes. So the question becomes, what order do you pick disputes to have? Right? Because, because I could just walk around finding people and being like, let's, let's argue about head coverings. Right. right? Or, or I can, or I can, or I can say, let's argue about, um, whether the scriptures are infallible and systematically true. Real and quick, then, okay, ju- well, just out of curiosity, are you a head covering guy? Yeah, we, we do head covering Me in our too. church. And so people bring it yeah. up early because they see women covering their heads and they go, right. so do I have to, we have to like cover our heads we, together? Like, well, to the men, no. You right, don't have exactly. To, yeah, to the I'm women, not, no, either. Um, but but we, we think that you should, but, right. but that's something that we don't require, for example, for membership. It, exactly. Or, or we don't like require that. it, but um, but my wife and daughters wear a head covering and I've, I've talked about it. And you know, I try not to make it a point of division, but it's another one of those things. It's like, you know, the Bible has something to say about this. There is a right position. And especially when you study that one in light of the, the, the text, but also throughout church history, I mean, the, it's the dominant lion share of church history <laughs> is head covering until, until really, you know, I mean, it, late 1800s and especially, you know, the 1950s and 60s. And there were even, you know, with the temperance movement, you know, and first wave feminism and things like that, they, they, uh, c- certain groups of women in local churches even scheduled like the same Sunday that they, in protest, they were all going to take off their hats and throw them down. And you look at that and, and then you look at what it was teamed up with. And it's like this, the same group that was anti head covering was the same group, you know, that was propelling feminism and all. And it, w- when you look at the history of it, it's like, it's hard to argue that this is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's very clear in the scriptures, but I also think that one of the things that we try to look for is how can you avoid how can you avoid uh, making additional barriers right. um, you know, without dishonoring the Lord? Right. Our goal is to honor the Lord, and then how do we also make it so people can initially you know, come in? And I, and I think that the idea that one thing is I think the goal actually is over time we want the church to come to unity in a place where we actually end up making it more complicated to become a member and more complicated to become an officer, right? Mm -hmm. An officer today should be required to have a lot more knowledge than an officer would have been required to have in the third century in the church. Right. Um, And that's because we have all the work that was done beforehand. But also probably Um, less knowledge than a Puritan officer would have had in the 1700s because sadly we have regressed. Absolutely. So, I mean, you write, you, you look, you read like the commentaries that the great Baptist John Gill wrote or, right. or, or the great Presbyterian Matthew Poole or something like that. And the scholarly level on that versus like, you know, the stuff that gets published today, right. you know, you just, you know, you go, I'm going to keep reading Gill and Poole. Right. Um, so I think this idea of the pursuit of the goal of greater unity of the doctrine, one of the things that happens, I think in Ephesians in the text is um, it talks about the idea of the bond of, of peace. Um, and this, this idea of, of bearing with one another in love and endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I think the bond of peace, whenever you see the word bond in Scripture, you should be thinking about covenant. Um, this idea that you form a, a, a bond that's established by oaths or by vows. And, and so the bond of peace is the covenant of peace or the covenant of grace. Um, but it's also a bond that establishes peace between Jew and Gentile and all that, where, where there's this, in the new administration of the covenant of grace, we're sharing together in this covenant administration. And so this idea that the context of covenant. And so I think the other thing you mentioned is this idea of how do you make it so it's not impossible for people to join. Uh, and I think that you have to recognize the biblical idea that there are levels of maturity. And so the, the Apostle John talks about children young men and fathers. And so uh, what I think is important is that you have sort of a minimal set of doctrine that's, that's necessary to teach people in sort of, you might, you know, membership classes are typically how this gets done in churches, but you have some sort of a church government. And, and I think the idea of a shorter catechism, like the, the whole purpose of, 
of differentiating between a larger catechism and shorter catechism in the Presbyterian tradition is to say the shorter catechism is the milk that's necessary to help somebody to come to the table so they can commune. And then a larger catechism is how you mature somebody in its meat. Right. Um, and I think this, I, this realization that there's a, there are stages in the process of development of the Christian life. And we're so individualistic in America that we like to pretend like everybody's journey is totally unique. Um, and it's just like, no, actually, my experiences are overwhelmingly going to be, have points of reference that are similar in the experiences of, of believers throughout history and that are referenced, obviously, in the scriptures. And the scriptures give us a, a you know, complete set of all the stuff we need to address all the experiences that we have in the Christian life. Right. But so, so this idea that there's, there's sort of there's stages. So the, the, the child, the young man, and the father. Um, and, and I think that what we need to recognize is what's really necessary for, for the child is going to be essentially you're going to have a commitment to the doctrine of the Scripture and its authority. You're going to have a, a, some sort of a shorter catechism or something like that for introductory teaching for people. And then you're going you're gonna to have in that introductory category, you're going to necessarily have you know, the solas, Tula, mm -hmm. Trinity, incarnation, and a basic federal headship of, of Adam and Christ. You don't have to have yeah. a really elaborate covenant theology or whatever, but you need to understand that you know, you're sinful in Adam and you're, 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 you're righteous in Christ. Right. And so those, those things are going to give you, here's the stuff we got to give to people. And so often people treat like tulip, like it's some like grand thing that you need to deal with when you're a father or whatever. It's just like, now that's, that's milk that guards the solas. Um, and, and, and so then you, you also need to have a commitment to the basic law order that, that the Ten Commandments summarizes and, and some sort of a commitment about based upon that local church, you're going to have to deal with how the sacraments are administered. You're going to have to deal with some sort of submission to church authority. And then you're going to have to, to deal with, um, with prayer because it's essential to the Christian life. Right. So that's actually the content of the Shorter Catechism. Um, and so... You know, those things, I don't think you look at the Shorter Catechism. I've had a lot of really solid Reformed Baptist friends that, that basically are like, yeah, I agree with the Shorter Catechism in elaborate detail, except when we get to the baptism part, right? And so it's just, the, the, you know, you can just grab that slightly. Yeah. If, if there's not a better Baptist Catechism that can be used, you can grab that, you know, replace the baptism part, and you've basically got something. So right. I think that those that idea, if, if there's a rejection of what's there in the Shorter Catechism, there's a fundamental rejection of, of the basics of the faith. Right. No, you're right. That this is not um, this is not uh, elite theological, you know, uh, higher education for theologians. I, we've just we the, the bar has fallen so far um, that I remember Vody Bauckham saying, you know, years ago uh, that anytime you find a young man who's zealous for the Lord and you know possesses some you know some theological you know, inclination, like, Hey, he's got some potential, you know, in the, in the theological realm, it seems like he's got a sharp mind, uh, and he's, he's zealous for theology and he knows a few things. Um, many people in the church just instinctively, um, uh, begin to push him towards the pastorate and say, well, you should consider going to seminary. I think you're called to be a pastor. And part of the reason we do that, um, is really to protect ourselves, um, uh, our own apathy towards doctrine. And these kinds of things. So what, what we want to do is because he's got to be called to pastoral ministry, because if he's not, that's how we assuage our, our guilty consciences, because if he's not, well, then maybe he's just, um, maybe this is actually normative. Maybe he's just uh, your average, <laughs> you know, young Christian man. Um, and so then, you know, then, then what do I say about myself? You know, but if I can say like, oh, well, he's, you know, he's a, a Christian 2.0. He's, he's one of those rare special guys. Then I can, then I can maintain the illusion that, um, that I'm, you know, I'm not bad. I'm just the average Christian and he's above average when the reality is no, the bar has slipped and fallen so much that, um, the, the guys right now that we send to seminary to be pastors, um, they're, you know, again, going back to, you know, earlier times in the 1700s and 1800s, these just would have been, you know, many of them uh, would have just been your average Christians. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the things, you know, you pointed out in a, in a lecture that I was able to enjoy hearing you give, uh, you had said that, you know, all over the place, we're essentially in a place where we keep promoting people to their point of incompetence. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of that is any gifting at all that might relate to some office, the, the tendency to push people up. And I think what you just brought up, that idea of trying to assuage your own guilt is, is a part of, is a part of why, 
Um, and so, you know, you, you have been an advocate, you know, like in your book, you, you advocate this idea that gathering around a particular location so you can work together, the need to concentrate because we've diffused too much, whereas we've dissipated our energy as a church and therefore made it so we're incapable of accomplishing anything. So we're, we're too spread out. We're led by people who are in positions that are just above their point of competency. And so that's obviously a recipe for success. <laughs> and so that's why we're winning all over right. the place. Just we're all tired of winning, right? This right. is, this is, this is what we're going through at winning exhaustion. So that's, <laughs> that's obviously destructive of, of all those ends. So, I mean, if we think about the process of maturing and we think we need to pull people in and mature them and have well ordered sort of teams, I think there's also this idea that the young man is differentiated in John. In First John, he says the young men fight. Mm. And so the, the fighting of the young men is, is an indicator. You're trying to ch – you raise children until they've got basically those things in place where they, they understand the basic doctrines, they understand the basic law order, they understand how to use the means of grace, and then they're kind of getting into the rhythm of Christian life with, you know, how does their worship go and stuff like that? And then they're also trying to get into how do I get into Christian community, right? So once they're plugged into those things, most people, a lot of pastors look at that and like, great success. We're done here. Like this is like masterful. Like this guy, this is done. Well, that's when they're able to now be useful fighting men. Right. No, and good. so, and so that, that idea that the fighting, then you, you have them go and do ministry, you have them do evangelism, you have them work through you. And, and, and you're, you're starting to go through things like, Let's talk about the confession. Let's talk about the larger catechism. Let's, let's get an overview of the Bible. Let's make it so you have some idea of how the books of the Bible fit together. You're starting to really get them the system. And they're going to get lumpy in different areas. And they're going to be really good at this and terrible at that. And, and your, your goal is to help to make a more mature, developed individual where their weak points are not disastrous anymore. And their strong points are really able to be used powerfully. Right, and so you know, in First John, you, you're right because it's it's those three categories. I remember you know preaching through First John, and for the little children, uh, there's a major emphasis. Uh, really, only two emphases. Uh, one is on um, that uh, that you recognize that uh, it's the the doctrine of adoption that you recognize that God is your Father, um, and so understanding Father God, and in 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 that you know the Father. Uh, the Father is God, but the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Spirit. Your basic Trinitarian doctrine, uh, you could include, you know, you could derive from that, uh, that there's at least a, uh, a minimum understanding of Trinitarian theology. Um, so understanding, you know, God is Father, adoption. And then the second emphasis for little children is the forgiveness of sins, uh, that from the first day of conversion, um, that there is uh, inherently um, a basic understanding of salvation. And so I think a lot of, when I think of, you know, catechisms for the new believer, a lot of it is going to be a uh, basic doctrine of God, theology proper, knowing God as father and the father is distinct from the son and the spirit, and then the forgiveness of sins. So teriology and an understanding of salvation um, that God saves and also how God saves. Uh, but then for young men, you're right. It's uh, the, um, I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then when he, and he repeats all these things twice, and then the, you know, the second time where he says it, I write to you young men because the word of God dwells richly in you. And, and so then he gives the means by which they have overcome the evil one. They haven't just done it by brute strength. Uh, they've done it by the indwelling, rich indwelling of the word of God. And so uh, now it's moving from just uh, theology proper and soteriology to a more um, comprehensive biblical theology, you know, from Genesis to Revelation is how you could exegete that. And the, the whole word of God is now dwelling in you. And, and then with the word of God, you, the law word of God. And so understanding more of, you know, God's law. And then, and then lastly, I write to you fathers. And that one almost seems the most simplistic, but I think it's actually that, you know, it's, it's the most beautiful and complex um, of all. Uh, but I write to you fathers for, you know, he who is from the beginning. Um, and so now there's this, this ancient of days, um, and not just ancient of days, speaking of God himself, but this ancient passed down historic body of doctrine. Uh, you know him who is from the beginning. You, and this, uh, you now are the embodiment, the full embodiment of all those saints who came before you, the full work of the Christian theology and doctrine that's been passed down generation from generation. And First John will preach, I guess is what I'm saying. So No, that's that's amazing. Thank you for that, brother. That's awesome. Yeah. And and I, I think one of the glorious things about the tail end of it with the fathers 
is it basically repeats, you know, you, you know, the father it says right. it like twice, right? There's a full but circle. It's like, yeah. It's like this emphasis on the deep, deep knowledge of God, right? It's like, it's a Hebraism of, of this, like, you know, God, you know, God, like this, the deep knowledge of God. So we just, the knowledge of God is how we are sanctified. Right. And, and, and the word of God is how we get the knowledge of God. And that results in the bearing of fruit. And so I just, you know, this, this idea that the deep knowledge of God, the rich knowledge of God is how we're matured. Um, and, and that as pastors, we have to teach the doctrine. We also have to rebuke people because we become blind. And, and so this rebuking part, it's always been the hardest part for me of the pastoral ministry is just, is just the rebuking, the correcting of showing them what to put on. Right. And then you have this training in righteousness. This is the second Timothy three sixteen stuff where the word of God is profitable for or useful for. And the training part of, of walking through it, giving the example, giving on the spot rebuke and correction and, and helping to, you know, watch and give critique and, and all that kind of stuff where you're, you're helping them to work it out. Um, I, I think that that's what the, the young man stage is really about. The young man stage is really about helping them to, to do that in the context of fighting. And right. the child stage, you're doing that in the context of sheltering, right? You're, you're giving the protection of the Christian community. You're trying to protect them from heresy and all that. The young man stage, you're like, hey, go read this heretical stuff. Let's talk about it. Like, you know, what, what, critique this thing. You're like, or, or, let's go out here. Let's go engage on the street and do evangelism with other people. Or, okay, do apologetics in, in your own community and network and the people that you know and try to evangelize and pull them in. You know, we oftentimes just try to get people saved and then just try to get them to go evangelize right away. And I go, Hey, let's, let's get you safe. Let's, let's create, now let's disciple. Let's get the basic stuff in there. And then once they're young men, you kind of go, okay, now let's, let's train. Now you can start to take some risks more in your, in your network. Opportunity arises and you're immature. Okay, great. But you're, you, you know, this, there's sometimes where you have to kind of push past boundaries where people don't want to talk about things of the Lord, don't want to know what's going on with you, becoming a Christian or whatever. And you got to take risks of pushing past. I think that young man stage is really where you want to encourage people to take those risks in their network. Right. By the time when they're they're a little they've become a little bit competent at using the sword, right. um, and so that uh that that thing, I think from from there the young man I think a lot of times a young man who's learning to fight that's really a great place for a guy to be a deacon, mm-hmm. um, because there's two promises with the office of deacon, the office of deacon has the promise that you know, you'll gain boldness by exercising it well, and that you'll get good reputation, right? And those are things you really need for the office of elder, and I, I wish. You know, God's providence and everything. But, you know, I, I haven't, I didn't go through the office of deacon before becoming an elder. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, it may have been a good thing for me to help me to be better at things like rebuking, because I would have had to go through more of that grind in that less, um, less high office, right. uh, being kind of forced to go through some of those conflicts without as much stress on it. Right. Um, and so, so that's just something that and that is looking, a lot of the diaconate. People don't think they think of the deacon's food drive. They think you know, well, it's just you know, it's just charity. It's just welfare. You're you know, you're uh, phys- caring for the physical needs of widows and orphans, and um, and and that's just to misunderstand the descriptive nature of Acts chapter six with these seven men. Number one, like just the bar, seven men filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. It's 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 not that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom um, so that we can pass out soup. Uh, the saints are doing back to Ephesians four. The saints are are responsible as the executive office of uh, carrying out the work of ministry. Uh, but what these deacons are going to be doing is organizing that work, uh, seeing to it that no widow is overlooked. But not just that, widows have already been overlooked, and so they're doing a ton of reconciliation and conflict management. You have not just two individuals or two households. You have two entire sects of a massive church in Jerusalem. This is a, we know it's a large church because 3,000 are added to the the faith at Pentecost when Peter preaches in Jerusalem. So a massive church, and you could basically uh, look at it and divide it in half. Half of the church is upset at the other half and vice versa. The Hellenistic Jews uh, who are saying that our widows have been overlooked in the daily distribution and then the Hebraic Jews. And so the deacons are coming in and they're not just making sure that poor people get fed. Um, they, the deacons are coming in and people are at each other's throats and they have to solve this conflict and seek, you know, reconciliation, restoration between two halves of the church that are right now on the verge of threatening to, to it's they're, they're right on the verge of a church split. And, um, and, and we're not even a century in to the, the Christian gospel. And so this is a massive, 
uh, task laid before them. And then I think of, you know, that's all descriptive and things that, you know, principles we can glean from the text, uh, but then prescriptive in terms of the qualifications of deacons that we find later in first Timothy three, uh, it totally makes sense when you cross reference Acts six and first Timothy three, that the one distinctive, and of course we can assume by way of implication that an elder should have this qualification as well. But the fact that the apostle Paul underneath the inspiration of the spirit finds finds it necessary to specifically mention one distinct qualification for a deacon that's not mentioned for the elder, which is he must not be double-tongued. And I think there's something unique to the office of deacon that it's kind of like mom in a household that can get, uh, if the kids are being manipulative, can get pitted against, you know, mom is, it becomes this mediator, this go, uh, going back and forth in between dad, uh, head of household, and then the children, the citizens of this household state, um, it, you know, mom can uh, be tempted if she's not wise and sanctified and godly to say one thing to the kids and then another thing to dad. Um, and, and so too, I, I think deacons between elders and congregants, right? The, the, the congregants, uh, there's uh, things that eventually do need to rise to the level of elder, but there's a lot of things that don't where the elders need to devote themselves to the reading and preaching of the word of God and prayer uh, and study. Um, but you know, the, the deacons should care for this and, and there could be a temptation in the diaconate, um, to, you know, just to hush, hush, tell the congregants, tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear. Um, mm -hmm. and, and even bad mouth the elders like, yeah, I know that, you know, he's not sensitive and yeah, he's kind of, you know, was harsh the other day, this elder, this pastor, and I'm really on your side. And then, you know, in a deacon and elders table and in a meeting, oh yeah, I understand you know, the congregation's immature. And so there can be this temptation when you're doing conflict resolution between two parties and the deacons probably had that same temptation, not just with elders and congregants, but to uh, to groups of congregants, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews, and and the temptation to be double tongued, and so all that being said, um, for that particular portion of an elder's role that does include conflict management, uh, man, you can really cut your teeth in conflict management as a deacon because I think I think that's uh, a, a massive portion of what the diaconate does. Are you a Christian struggling to find companies that align with your values and beliefs? Well, then Squirrely Joe's has you covered for all your coffee needs. All of their coffee is hand-selected and roasted fresh every day by a family of fellow believers. Try them out and you'll savor exceptional coffee while knowing that your investment supports a company committed to following God's teachings and upholding truth and righteousness, ensuring that your hard-earned money contributes to the growth of God's kingdom. Stop giving your hard-earned dollars to pagans who support evil. Right Response listeners have access to an exclusive deal. Your first bag of coffee is free. All you have to do is cover the shipping. So head on over to squirrelyjoes.com forward slash right response. Again, that's squirrelyjoes.com forward slash right response to claim your first free bag of coffee today. The danger of centralized power is often represented by the word king. As Americans, we hate the word king. Civilian ownership of body armor is about helping people to have increased power to resist tyrants and criminals. And so Armored Republic is about helping you to preserve your God-given rights to the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the king of kings and he governs kings and he will judge them. This is Armored Republic and in a republic, there is no king but Christ. We are free craftsmen and we are honored to be your armor spread of choice. Brother, that was excellently described. I mean, like the scenarios I can have, I have scenarios flashing through my head from stuff I've seen throughout my life of exactly <laughs> that. And I think, so what we do in, in our diaconal training is we go, okay, there's, there's doctrine portion, but the part of the practical portion is conflict resolution, which requires, you to know, basic biblical counseling and catechesis. Right. And so you think, you know, that's all private ministry stuff, right? It's not a function of church government, but deacons, as they're doing that, as they're engaging people's lives, so often they're going to, people go, hey, I need mercy ministry help. It's like, great. Do you know how to, are you, are you running a budget or are you just like blowing your money? Right? right. And so, so this idea of like basic life management stuff, like, like budget and, um, and how to deal with conflict 
how to deal with uh, basic biblical counseling, and how to deal with you know, basic catechesis. And so you, you get so much, you get so much done that way. And I love that work actually of like going in and doing that. And I've recently had to, you know, get, get that more off of my plate because I just don't have time for it. And I'm drawn to doing it. And so, so I'm, I'm having to, to deal with that. And I'm really enjoying preparing some of our, our, our newer diaconal nominees, for example, on some of that. So it's been a fun training process, but that is so practical. I think something that people don't understand. And so that if, if you're a deacon and you're giving mercy ministry, you're going to see the details of someone's house. Right. You're almost, you're almost there and you, and you're unavoidably going to run into those problems and helping people to get to that place. And that Jethro principle from Exodus 18, that you just mentioned, not everything gets to the elders, not right. everything gets to, you know, Moses. if you believed in a, a series of courts, for example, that were beyond the local church, you might say not every one of them goes to those higher courts too. So, um, but that, that, that whole, that whole thing. So how does this all fit into to unity? Um, and, and I think that people, you know, you, you, go read the Ephesians text that you mentioned before, Ephesians 4, you're going to find everybody operating according to their station makes it so that people are able to divide the labor efficiently and encourage people to be trained. So if immature believers are being trained by young men in the faith, by deacons and stuff in the faith, then that's that's able to be done. And the more complex problems are able to be dealt with by the fathers in the faith. Right. And so you're able to have well-reasoned, well-done stuff as opposed to overloaded, o- overloaded officers, overloaded elders. They're able to really do a great job of teaching through the points of disagreement that become more complex. Mm-hmm. And they can start to give you your handouts and organized information and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and so I think one of the examples of this has happened in the, t- in the church just in our own time, Pastor Philip Kaiser has like amazing handouts for like every sermon he gives. Just these, these great like, handouts of the organization of the stuff. And I think that must testify to the fact that at their church, they're able to really well organize that to give this guy the time right. uh, to actually put together these amazing documents for, for these sermons. And so that kind of stuff where the teaching is able to be done well, have it be, here's handouts, here's information, here's stuff you get to look at as a congregation, that's going to encourage unity in the faith. Um, and so there's this proper or division of labor um, and so then the, with the fathers being those who are really, uh, really deeply knowledgeable, being those who are able to teach the more advanced elements, and they're able to carefully guard the confessional standard. Um, and so they're going to be able to pick, and we talked before about the idea of when you, when you pick conflicts, you want to pick the more basic ones as opposed to the less basic ones. Right. And so the Westminster Confession, the London Baptist Confession, you look at the order of the chapters, they're systematically ordered. The first one's on scripture, how do you know? Right. And the last one's going to be about, you know, the day of judgment. And so you have this, this stuff that it kind of builds, you know, chapter one, scripture, chapter two, the nature of God, uh, chapter three, the decrees of God. So how does God do things in terms of creation and providence? And, and it just rolls out in this logically ordered way. When you have disagreements, your goal is to see, well, do we dis- do we, do we, do we agree about the more basic things? Right. And you avoid fighting about all the hot button issues. And your goal is to drive the discussion to the points that are more systematically foundational. Right. And that way you can actually find where the real source of disagreement is, as opposed to fighting about a bunch of little, you know, hot button issues at the top. You're, you're trying to go, okay, well, do we actually agree that the word of God is, is true? Do we agree that the word of God is systematic and non contradictory? Okay. Do we agree that God is, is, is this God? And so when you get to disagreements with, for example, between Calvinists and Arminians, you're, you're disagreeing at, at chapter two. You're disagreeing right. about the nature of God. Um, and so talking about a bunch of other stuff there, we need to come to agreement about who God is, what he is. Um, and so you're, you're trying to find the point of departure, where it is in the system, and to be able to work through that there. And, and that's, that's, I think, part of what fathers train the young men in. The young men who like to fight are going to kind of pick whatever battles. And part of how you help them to have discipline is to say, don't fight about everything that comes across your path. You, you find the point of disagreement that's most basic with the person and try to focus on that. And right. sometimes there's practical things you got to deal with along the way, like a sin that manifests itself. That's less basic. You got to deal with it. But, but you're also trying to overlook as many sins as you can. So you're not rebuking people about everything all the time. So these are, I think these are some of the practical tactics of unity uh, before we go back to some of the, the bigger, broader ones. I don't know anything you want to add about the tactics of unity. 
Yeah, no, I think that's really good. I, it's, you know, you need the theological triage so that you have an order of priority for fighting. What's worth fighting about? What, what do we, where do we fight first? Which hills to die on? And in order to have the theological triage, you need systematic theology. Biblical theology is indispensable, yeah. but, but I think for purposes of triage, systematic theology is key. And, you know, people are bothered by that. They don't like labels. They don't like systems, you know, and, and uh, all those kinds of things. And, um, and you'll put, you know, pretty little cliches in order to defend your position for why you don't like, you know, systems or labels. Um, but, but really it's a rejection of authority. It's, uh, it's a reject. It's wanting to be your own pope and make all of your own decisions yep. and, and atomistic, individualistic. Um, it's arrogance. It's rooted in arrogance. Systematic theology, just for the listener, um, is not imposing uh, man systems on the God breathed text. Instead, it's going to the text, uh, reading it carefully, and then discerning out of the text, not reading systems into the text, eisegesis, imposing our systems, but it's looking at the text and saying, well, what do we know about the character and nature of God? Well, we know that he's a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He's not a God of disorder. Uh, so I'm not um, imposing a system on the text. I am counting on the God of order that he has placed a system in the text and I want to find it. So I'm not bringing a system to the text. I'm drawing out of the text a system. And then when we have systematic theology, it is constructed um, in, in not a biblical order of Genesis to Revelation, but in, in logical order. Um, and, and in that logical order, there's an order of priority. And so that sets the triage of, of um, must believe, should believe, may believe, and then we're able to start there. And that helps us, I think, from some of the, the further fracture, fracturing and, um, and dividing uh, to be able to, you know, because part of the reason that we're uh, dividing on some things is because, you know, part of it is, is being too petty and too particular, but part of it also is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, some, some of these divisions, uh, we're dividing now on social justice or the solution for social justice with so-and-so, which ironically, we should have been divided with so-and-so from the very beginning. Uh, I think, of, for instance, you know, um, you know people, people in the last couple of years have felt shocked that, uh, that James Lindsay is not on our team. And I'm like, guys, he's an atheist. He's not even, he's not even in the realm of like, we're shocked at, oh, we're, we're shocked. At, so James Lindsay, um, turns out he wants to guard, uh, all the benefits of a Christian nation, uh, that afford him the ability to, uh, just to go through life, to have, uh, you know, to, to not be, uh, you know, to, to just, it preserves his liberty and all these kinds of things. Like all that comes from the Christian faith. There is no liberty apart from the Christian worldview. So uh turns out uh, he wanted to defend, you know, seemingly defend some basic, you know, uh, but, but he was never defending the Christian faith. He was defending what the Christian faith produced for him, its blessings. Um, right. uh, but, but then when it comes to actually the solution, uh, he, he doesn't want uh, a Christian nation he just wants, uh, you know, classical liberalism as a as a uh, later fruit of the Christian worldview, um, and but that's that's not my goal. My goal is not to uh, to bring us back to the you know the good old days of the 1980s. Um, my, my my goal is no. I want a distinctly uh, Christian nation, and of course, I'm not going to be able to count on someone like James Lindsay um, to be a co belligerent towards that aim, and so. Um, so my point is, you know, some some of the fracturing that we're having now, not all of it, but some of the fracturing we're having now is we're we're actually we're we're just starting to realize that that we're divided on chapter, for instance, to put it into like confessional terms, we're divided on chapter twenty seven. Well, you know, and it's like oh, I'm losing allies, I'm losing friends. Yeah, but honestly, you're you're dividing on chapter twenty seven. But if you'd been a little bit more discerning, you would have realized that you you were already divided on chapter two and three and four. And of course, uh, of course, this was not going to happen. So I think assuming the center, that's what, you know, I think there's a geographic application of this. I think there's an ideological uh, and methodological applica application of this, certainly a theological application of this. But right now, in terms of what time is it, the sons of Issachar, what do we do today? They knew the times and they knew what Israel should do. 
So they weren't just commentators. Oh, I know the times. I know how bad, bad it is. No, no, they also had a plan. They knew right. what uh, Israel should do. And I think right now what Israel, the church of Jesus Christ, uh, needs to do, given the times, is we need to realize that our, our high water mark, like you've uh, so, so wonderfully said, is behind us, unfortunately. We've actually regressed because of sin, because of foolishness, because of compromise. So we need to go back, and also we need to assume the center. Uh, it's, it is not a time for, uh, for spreading out. Um, that, that is the ultimate goal, to be fruitful and spread out over the whole earth and subdue it through the Great Commission and the cultural mandate. Uh, but right now, um, I think we need to fall back. Uh, we've spread too thin. We need to fall back from behind enemy lines. We need to consolidate. I think in the name of the game right now is consolidation geographically, theologically, at, and then go and find what's, uh, what's the lowest, you know, the, the uh, uh, well, not the low, but what's actually the highest common denominator where we can agree. Um, yeah. and, and how close is that towards the highest watermark we have thus far in 2000 years of church history. Okay, so here's where we can agree now. Here's the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, uh, let's consolidate here where we can agree. Let's spend the next 50 years seeing if we can get back to, to the high watermark that we had 500 years ago. And now let's, uh, let's, let's push forward. You know, and now we can talk about maybe spreading out again. Um, those seem so clear to me, like just practical, basic strategy and tactics. Um, but man, you'd be surprised. You know, that's basically, you know, some of, some of, you know, the, the content from my talk that I gave at, at the new Christendom conference. And, and I was encouraged. A lot of people loved it, uh, but it was a love hate kind of uh, lecture that I gave. Uh, the people <laughs> who loved it really loved it. And then there were a few people that <laughs> really, really, I mean, you know, they're like, this was my least favorite talk because I told, because uh, I, I just, I just kind of straight up told people what to do. Uh, like, we don't have time. Stop being cute. This is what you need to do. And that, you know, and I think that's kind of what we need right now. We need a few people to say like, okay, that's enough. That's silly. It's always been silly. Stop it. And this is what we need to do. And I think the need, you know, essentially one of the things you pointed out to people is they need to move to a place where there's already a solid church and really a solid Christian borough where there's right. economic activity church activity, there's hospitality, there's there's people that are going to be helping to work together that are desirous of accomplishing the same goals. And you need a good good amount of unity there. That's hard to find in a lot of places. So being willing to move there. And if if you can't move for some reason, like you've got duties, you've got stuff that ties you there, whatever, maybe you've already got some of the beginnings of it. Okay, well, focus the energy on making that work. Um, if you can't make it work there, then you've, you've got to leave. Yeah. Right? So there's either there's either already a solid church there where this is happening, or a solid church and it requires a little bit of pushing and effort to get to building that borough, or you have the capacity to do it and a duty to stay, or you need to leave, right. and, and that's it. And and so that's how simple that is. Um, and I think most people we over evaluate what we're able to do on our own in timeframes. Um, and so we need to realize the need to divide labor, to accumulate capital, to 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 make it so that we can build off of what other people have already started. Um, and so I think a lot of people miss out on that. And so yep. places where that where that's happening, where there's education, Christianity in the church, households that are in good order, money being made with businesses, all that stuff together, that's sort of the 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 stuff that's necessary for a Christian borough or a I've been calling it the Geneva strategy before I you know heard the idea of that. Just the idea that you right. flee to a place where you can consolidate, get control, and then you can project power out. Yep. Um, and so you're going to look at what happened in Geneva. Um, and so, but I think there's two things there that, that have to also be focused on, which is church unity through confessional covenanting. Right. And then the civil order. And so you talked about, I think you might, you and I might disagree here. And I, I'd be curious about whether it would be helpful for people to think about how the order around this is in the civil order, I would say we can have a highest common denominator without regard to really the history. And we just kind of go, can we agree on a basic political platform of seeing Christ acknowledged as the King of Kings, his word right. acknowledged as the authoritative thing, uh, biblical Christian liberty defended as defined by the Bible, and biblical justice administered as defined by the Bible? Those would be sort of four big political goals. And and then they, how do you make that happen? Well, I think you there's, a, there's an ordinance of civil covenanting um, that we have to be willing to swear to pursue those things together. And then we have to be willing to commit to certain actions around that. That's going to be things like 
having a shared arbitration system. It's going to be swearing to defend each other if, if, if they start to come after each other. You know, if they come after you as a Baptist or me as a Presbyterian, the idea that we'd be willing to come and defend each other or, or provide sanction for each other. Um, this idea that we would swear to argue with each other about the disagreements in order to seek to come to greater unity until we die. Right. Um, and, and that's, and that's where I think that context happens of, having that debate to try to get back to a high watermark, it's inside of a civil covenant where we're already swearing to accomplish certain things together. Um, and then our goal is to see ecclesiastical unity and greater unity inside of that. So I think we have the freedom be- because of our context to, to have a, a more loose civil covenant where we're swearing certain things to each other um, than we might have in an ecclesiastical context. Right. Because I think it, it'd, be, it'd be sin for us to fall away from the in the church, kind of the, the high water mark has been attained. And I think it's our job to rally around that. Um, and so that, that other thing that's necessary inside of a civil covenant is we need to start having commitments to meet in some areas to make sure that we are physically fit and prepared to competently make sure that we do our duties as men and to have some sort of way where that's financed. And so those are the components of the civil covenant uh, that I think are necessary. Um, and those are the places that make us that we're meeting physically. And one of the things you said in your, in your speech that you gave at the conference recently was this idea that when you're seeing each other in person and interacting in person, how it helps. Now, that happens at the local church, but I think also this idea of some sort of regular training together in the context of a civil covenant is another place where that occurs, where you you have that camaraderie in the trenches and everything. And as you're doing business with each other and doing hospitality from house to house, those are the things that would encourage that growth in unity and the discussions and would also create social pressure on elders between those churches that are connected in that way to keep talking with each other and to try to work through those differences and to have public discussion where they're accountable for the words that they say to each other. Right. That's good. Yeah, no, I agree with all of that. I think you and I, the only disagreement we would probably have would be minor, but, um, it matters, but, but it wouldn't be a grandiose, you know, uh, m- you know, massive disagreement, but, um, would just be on in the civil covenanting, um, just, you know, how theologically, uh, what, what is that, you know, that highest common denominator, you know, that, uh, that we would accept for that, but everything, all the other elements of, you know, arbitrating our own, uh, disagreements per first Corinthians chapter six, that's just a clear biblical, uh, principle that we're not, you know, we're not going to the pagan courts um, unless unless we absolutely have to. We're, that we're first trying to arbitrate uh, disputes uh, among Christians with our own courts. Uh, that there would be some kind of shared um, uh, resources, financial resources, uh, in order to accomplish our goals. Um, all those kinds of things. Completely agree with that. The local church ecclesiastical covenant uh, covenanting. I think uh, there, there must be a um, a higher. Um, higher watermark for that uh, for that theological standard within the ecclesiastical covenanting uh, realm, and I think that 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 high, the highest watermark that we currently have within two thousand years of church history is uh, from the Reformation. And so, going back and saying this is what we need at the church level, uh, and then at the civil level, at this point, you know, and I'm open to being persuaded, but at this point, I'm convinced. Uh, that at the civil level, uh, that we need, it needs to be a pan-Protestant project. So it must be distinctly Christian. I would advocate for, you know, um, a prelude or a preamble, you know, adopted to the constitution that is, um, that is the Apostles' Creed, that distinctly names the Lord Jesus Christ and the triune God as the, uh, the sole uh, object of our worship, that we are a Christian nation. Um, and then, you know, from that, um, I, think abs- I, I think there can be no debate uh, in terms of legislation, uh, that the state is obligated under God, uh, that the state won't be blessed and a nation won't be blessed um, any other way, that the, uh, the state is mandated by God to reward the righteous, punish uh, the evildoer, and that that necessarily includes both tables of the law, uh, that you cannot just have a state that um, that legislates horizontal laws in terms of the second table of the law, love for neighbor, uh, commandments five through 10. But uh, the, that's that's to... Uh, basically to try to ha- uh, hang the uh, the laws, the second table of the law in regards to love for neighbor in midair. And so it, it has to necessarily include the first table of the law. So I would say, you know, uh, Apostles Creed um, and 10 commandments, um, you know, and I would add to that the Apostles Creed, I would add the solas, 
um, and saying, uh, and this is the gospel. So um, uh, that, that we need uh, the soul is added to that. And that's what gets you uh, not just um, uh, a pan Christian, but a pan Protestant uh, project that's distinctly Protestant that says to the Catholic, Hey, you're welcome to be a part of this, but this is Protestant. Um, and, uh, and we're not going to abandon uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, this is, this is what we're doing. You're welcome to participate. Um, but we're going this direction and, and you don't get to, uh, you can be on, in the car, but you don't get to drive. Uh, the, the Protestants are driving. And I think the only uh, area, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, where we disagree is I think everything I said, I think uh, you're on board for. So uh, ecclesiastical uh, covenanting confession, give us the Westminster, give us the 1689 over here, creed, and then we'd add the solas. Uh, we're both uh, two tables of the law uh, guys uh, in terms of the state and legislative, blasphemy laws, blue laws, Sabbath laws, those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, the, the last thing is I think you would say, yep, give me the solas and give me tulip. And I think that's the, the, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the only place where I say, ah, you know, maybe 500 years from now, we'll get, we'll get tulip in there. I, I don't know if we're ready for it yet. Yeah. And I, I would say the reason I think that is because I think tulip is sort of the, the guardrails for the solas, right? When, when you, if you abandon total depravity um, and you abandon the idea of, of limited atonement, um, you know, you, you're, you're, you're abandoning with total depravity that it's by grace alone. You're, you abandon limited atonement. You're abandoning that it's by Christ alone. So these are almost definitional guardrails, I would say, for that. And so I think that's what the purpose was. And I think, you know, uh, when you look at the Synod of Dort being an international Protestant synod, uh, that, that capturing that and trying to guard the gospel, a reformed view of the gospel, I think that the historical context, they're saying, if you abandon this stuff, you're really abandoning the reformed view of the gospel. And so I think that it's, it's necessary if we're going to, if we're going to be able to, to guard it as being a, a Christian movement as opposed to uh, rejecting that. So that's obviously a controversial statement. Many people will be, be, be outraged by that. But, you know, if Christ, on a basic level, limited atonement's where the rubber hits the road here. Everybody, everybody freaks out at limited atonement. So just right. John Owen's solution here is this. Okay, let's think about this logically for a second. If Christ died for some of the sins of some people, nobody's saved. If he died for some of the sins of all people, still nobody's saved. If he, if he died for for all of the sins of all people, everybody's saved. And if he died for all of the sins of some people, then some people are saved. The only one right. of those is biblical. It's the last right. one. It's limited atonement. He right. paid for all the sins of some people. And if he paid right. for all the sins of all people, then everybody's saved. That's universalism. That's, that's unavoidable. And you, so you want to say, oh, well, faith is the connector there. It's like, okay, is faith, is unbelief a sin that Christ exactly. paid for or not? Yep. Right. right. That's so, what I was going to say. Yeah. It reje- so it's like, oh, he paid for all of your sins, but you still have to accept his payment. Well, is the rejection of his payment a sin? Yes. Did he pay for that sin? Yes. So, as, yeah. So I'm, I'm with you in terms of, um, I think it's thoroughly biblical. John chapter 10, the shepherd, he doesn't lay down his, his life for goats. He doesn't lay it down for wolves, um, you know, he, but he lays down his life for the sheep. So there's a particular redemption, uh, definitive re- redemption. Uh, so I think it's f- uh, firmly biblical, but it's also thoroughly logical uh, because it really does call into question the justice of God. Uh, if Jesus died for people who ultimately go to hell, what is hell? but uh, the wages of sin. It's the wages of sin, the payment um, uh, for sinning against a thrice holy God. And if people are paying that price, that penalty uh, themselves, and Jesus died for them, and Jesus' death on the cross is penal substitutionary atonement, which is the heart of the gospel, it's the penalty for sin, uh, then uh, then you're actually uh, accusing, it's levying an accusation against God himself in, in regards to his own essence and character that God is unjust. Uh, God is demanding double payment. Uh, he's demanding two punishments for one crime. This person sinned against yes. him, um, and that person has to pay it off for eternity. Um, and also, uh, his son Jesus, God chose to subject his own son, his beloved son, uh, to make a second payment uh, for something that is already being paid for eternally uh, by that person in hell. And so, uh, th- so logically, biblically, uh, in terms of uh, theology proper and doctrine of God, his essence, his character, his nature, justice being called it. So I'm fully on board uh, with that. And I think I could even get on board in terms of, I, th- I think you're right in terms of the five points of Calvinism, the doctrines of grace, uh, not being even a separate category uh, in so much as they are just a further, they're the footnotes and the further fleshing out of the five solas. So I like that uh, as well. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, 
which is why I would absolutely demand the tulip for ecclesiastical covenanting, but I just still not quite there for civil covenanting. So, so uh, let's talk about the pragmatics of this for just a minute, right? Yeah. So you're advocating the, the people gather around a point. I think that's brilliant. I think it's absolutely necessary. I think that's 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 a practical point that people need to hear. And I think that that um, you pushing on that. And helping people to feel freed from the guilt mongering that's been done that you need to like, you know, you need to be a missionary in blue land and right. you also need to send your kids to public school so they can become communists and gay. Right. right? Like, right. so this, this whole, this whole problem, you're trying to free people from it and saying, no, 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 come into a Christian enclave. Right. Right. That's, that's absolutely the case. I want to say those enclaves are what need to organize and need to connect. Yes. What's going to happen, what's going to yes. happen is, is those things we we need to be very careful about that and and the reality is we're going to make cities on the hill and every place else is going to be hell on earth right and and, and so if, if we have light and we're careful there to guard it i think that the idea of connecting the international reform uh you know they're the, the reformed throughout the the states uh we're gonna we're gonna end up having that network and if we, we carefully guard that the reality is there's about 30 million evangelicals in the country, maybe 10 million of those are Calvinistic or whatever. And, and so if that's the case, a few million gathering together and becoming more unified is going to be far more powerful than a dissipation of our doctrine and trying to have a larger coalition. What's yeah. going to happen is there, there are two things that the Lord promises. I just still see that. I, here's where I'm confused. I still see that as an ecclesiastic, so not a local church covenanting, but still this broader ecclesiastical, because because what you're describing is still between churches. Okay, which so to what, me what is I'm talking about is the these boroughs. So, so here's the deal. So being Presbyterian, right, I believe in, in covenanting between, right. between churches. multiple local churches. Yep. And I think historically a lot of Baptists and Congregationalists would have held the idea of, of a covenant between them, but the covenant wouldn't have been enforced by a court. You'd have had an association right. where you meet to discuss things, but it doesn't have the authority to do anything to, to remove they people. They would have seen or, the value, but you're right. It would have been volitional and it, it would have not been formally binding. Yeah. So I'm saying there should be the church court um, as well that's shared, but but there should also be an ecclesiastic or sorry, civil covenant. So there should be an ecclesiastical covenant and a civil covenant. And I want to see the churches covenanting with each other, but I also want to see their boroughs, the towns, the, the oh, zones, see, these little. Yep. We we have a civil sphere. So for example, you know, in oh, okay. Phoenix, there's there's apologia, which you know I have a lot of, conf a lot of confessional dis disagreements with with them. They hold the not quite the London Baptist, but I think, for example, I think we disagree on like Sabbath and, and some other right. stuff too. And so I'm happy to argue with them about that stuff and say, you know, I think you're wrong about that. I think that's sin, whatever. And they can say the same thing about there. And we're debating it, trying to come to unity. But but then on a civil level, we should be able to be in covenant. I should be happy to come and protect Jeff Durbin or, Je or, or James White if something happens to them in the civil sphere. So then we'd be arguing with each other also in that context of being under a shared one. So I think the same thing with, with you. So that'd be the civil element, and I'd be that's trying helpful, to encourage Because when you were churches. describing boroughs, that's what threw me off. When you said boroughs, I instinctively thought churches, and in that, you know, because I would put it in the category of not the state, but households, the family, I was thinking about, Christ, you know, Christian classical schools. So I was thinking churches and schools, um, but you were, you were thinking more like, um, you know, uh, not, not, not uh, Christ Church, but Moscow. Right, not not yes. Calvin's church, but Geneva. So you were thinking towns, and so included in that is not just the church and the school, but uh, businesses, economy, not just household things, but even um, you know c civil leaders in that realm. And so I hear you on that. Well, but one thing I definitely agree with is, um, and you may be right, uh, but I, one thing I definitely agree with is uh, at the ecclesiastical level. And this is even coming from a Baptist, you know, so you, you know, it's something, but, but even at the ecclesiastical level of churches, going back to just that and leaving towns on the side for a moment, um, one of my concerns is that, that people will assume the center, they will congregate, they will fall back from uh, behind enemy lines, but they'll have 17 different boroughs to choose from, which is good. I don't think we just need uh, the whole world can't move to Moscow. So we need more than one borough. Um, right now, I think we need to be honest with ourselves. We don't have 10,000 boroughs. 
a lot of right. guys might think, oh, well, I have a borough. You, you probably don't. Um, you know, but so I don't think we have a thousand boroughs, but we, we better have more than one borough. So let's say it's a hundred bor boroughs, you know, spread out, you know, around the states. Uh, we need to consolidate, fall back from behind enemy lines and, and assume the center and go to these boroughs. But then those boroughs, this is one of my biggest concerns, is uh, the leaders, ecclesiastical leaders of these boroughs, they, they better be um, getting in some serious face time with each other because it's not helpful if we go to the uh, Christian boroughs, but then our hundred Christian boroughs all disagree with each other. Yeah. And, and that's been really, one of the things I've found really hard um, and that I have found refreshing uh, specifically about you, but also um, uh, David Shannon, uh, Chocolate Knox. Yep. Uh, the, the, I've seen the two of you really be connectors yep. um, who are trying to help other people. Um, and I've seen you be open-handed with uh, things like honor, um, where there's this willingness to, to spend time to talk to people and to argue through things and to try to be charitable in interpretation, um, the willingness to, to sit down, to talk, uh, to communicate you know, through the, the, the electronic means we've got to get time, but also this idea of, of trying to spend time in person and to, to argue about stuff, talk through things, try to flesh things out in detail, uh, you know, spend the time that you have to spend on it, and then to connect other people and try to encourage that. Um, right. And so um, I think that, um, you know, when, when God willing, we don't, you know, let's say we don't lose and end up in the concentration camps, but instead we win. You know, if we, if we, the, the victors that, that write the history, hopefully we'll get to the point of the two of you guys as, as significant connectors um, mm -hmm. in, in the cause. And so I think that that's, that's a key part of it. That, and that's a priestly gifting, right? You think about right. leaders, what kind of gifting they've got. If they've got prophetic gifting, they're you know, great teachers. They can argue well. They can deal with the logical ordering and, and all that. The, the, the priestly is, is the relational and trying to build the hedges and, and you know, protect the, the, the team and the cause. Uh, and then the kingly really can get stuff done, making things right. happen, organizing things, making sure the trains run on time. Uh, and so that, that stuff, we need all of that. And, and we, that's why we need, we all have our, our clay feet um, and we, we need the giftings of each other. And so I think that the priestly are going to be the ones that really help to gather people together to work. Um, and then the prophetic are going to be able to really focus on arguing to try to come to greater unity. And the kingly are going to really make sure stuff gets done. And everybody's right. got those giftings to various degrees. So, I mean, nobody's like free from doing any of those things. We all have to do all of them. But some people are going to be better at others and lean in on some of those pieces. And so I just um, I think my hope is that people see the value of working with each other. It's so easy to just not do it. Right. You, know, you, you can build your own fiefdom. You can do all this stuff. Like if you're not making the effort to connect, it's so easy to try to, to isolate and to try to build your own thing and to, to be away from other people. Right. Yeah. Especially, you know, the, the PTSD can, can click in, you know, especially if you've, um, if you feel like you've been hurt in the past, you know, then it's yeah. just, I'll just, I'm going to build a moat build up the walls and we'll just, we'll do our own thing. We'll insulate and, um, and we won't partner with anybody. And that's part of the reason why I, you know, why I want to do things like host conferences and mm -hmm. have as many guys there as I possibly can. Um, because uh, honestly, it, uh, it works as an accountability measure. Um, so, you know, like we've announced our conference, it's 10 months away. Uh, so one of the things now that uh, all 15 guys, you being one of them, uh, that we, you know, it's not, it's not written in a contract necessarily. And one day, you know, maybe it should be, but, um, but it just informally, uh, in the back of all 15 of these men's minds is like, I've got 10 months where I, I need to uh, play nice. I can't, you know, like for, cause I'm going to see all these guys we speaking at a conference with them. So for at least for the next 10 months, I probably should be a little bit nicer to them on Twitter. I probably don't need to burn these bridges. I probably, you know, um, those things really help. And, you know, to, you know, I think together for the gospel and those kinds of things, you know, with the gospel centered movement and, you know, new Calvinism, massive problems for one, just new Calvinism. I don't want new Calvinism. I, I want old Calvinism, but you know, to at least one particular area where it wasn't an utter train wreck. Um, there, there was, um, uh, you know, good can truly be said about guys like, you know, Mark Dever and Ligon Duncan and CJ Mahaney with three different, you know, theological positions um, saying, yeah, but we're, we're going to, you know, we love each other. We're, we love each other. Uh, the problem is, you know, that 20 years went by and uh, they still had three different 
theological positions <laughs> and there right. was no, it didn't even seem like it was on the table as, as one of their goals was to, Hey, but also maybe, you know, what if we agreed, you know, so it didn't even seem like that was one of their aims, but I will say that like I, probably the greatest fruit out of that movement was uh, these massive events where everyone said um, we're at least united on this. And, and so what we want to do, you know, I think one of the things that we want to do with it, whatever you want to call it with, Christian nationalism with theonomy, new Christendom, you know, what, whatever, you know, post-millennial hope. But what, one of the things that we want it to achieve is a theological maximalism. I think we've had for yes. too long a theological minimalism where you really did have some genuine relationships and it really did uh, have the ability to pack out a 20,000 person um, event once a year. And there really is fruit from that. There, there really are some blessings. I don't want to unnecessarily disparage that movement because there's plenty of things that I can disparage. That part, I don't want to disparage. And yet, even that part, as good as it was, uh, was still, um, it was a theological minimalism. It was it was, you know, basically it was, it was just kind of one step above Billy Graham from back in the day. You know, Billy Graham is just like, well, you know, the great commission has to be, um, fulfilled. And, uh, the biggest thing that's standing in our way is, uh, that we've, uh, we've spread too thin, divided our forces, you know, so if we're going to fulfill the great, basically the, the logic was this, we want Jesus to come back. Uh, we need to fulfill the great commission for Jesus to come back. Uh, in order to fulfill the great commission, we need to be on the same team. And in order to be on the same team, uh, we need to lower the bar. Doctrine divides, you know, and that's where you got, you know what I mean? That's, and, right. and, and, and so, uh, you know, and then the new Calvinist, you know, gospel, you know, Calvinist resurgence movement of the last, you know, 30 years or so was basically that, uh, but with a little higher bar and hopefully by the grace of God, what we're doing would be, it would be the, the good parts, Billy Graham esque and new Calvinism esque, except um, it would go from basically no theological commitments and then some theological commitments to a lot of theological commitments, a theological maximal, maximalism uh, that is uh, Calvinistic and not even new Calvinism, but old Calvinism tried and true and getting back to the historic watermark. And then, and then hopefully our kids can take it further. Absolutely. And so you used early on in our conversation here kind of three categories, the must believe, should believe, and the may believe. And I think that the way of defining those, the, the must believe is sort of the, here's the stuff you need to positively show understanding of to come to the Lord's table. Um, and that's sort of the, that would be sort of the stuff you require for the child in the church, right? So whatever your church membership covenant is. And at the same time, you don't want those, those children in the faith openly denying what you're confessing in terms of your church confession. But the idea is that they're not going to have thought through a lot of it, right? And so the point is that once they become aware of points of disagreement, the should believe stuff, you know, pastors come in and spend a lot of time trying to argue through and show them why they're, why they're in error and help to, to get them to the place where they're getting there. So the young men are being trained up to the should believe. And the fathers are maintaining all of the should believe. And then there's the may believe stuff, which is stuff that hasn't been captured in a confessional standard yet that your church right. has adopted. And that stuff is the stuff that we debate about in the hopes of having another advancement in the high watermark. And so, right. you know, maybe that'd be the Phoenix com uh, uh, confession, or maybe it's the Dallas confession, whatever. And, and so this, this idea that at a certain point that we are seeking to go beyond, right. that we, we rally around the should believe and we have a must believe bar that's sort of the membership and you're training the must believe into the should believe. And then there's the, you know, the may believe stuff. We're trying to argue about that after we've been able to come together and rally. And then we're trying to further define, but we give liberty on the may believe stuff, you know, in terms of some of the, the ways of, 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 of which views of, of eschatology of, of, you know, because you could have like a historic post-millennialism or you could have a, a you know, partial preterist post-millennialism, which I hold to, you know, and that kind of thing. And you could even have like an optimistic amillennialism. Some of the types of, you know, some of the views are going to make it so that you're essentially saying, yeah, I want to be a part of this movement, but I also think we're going to lose. And and I'm not sure where that line draws exactly, but, right. but my point would be there's probably a broader range on the eschatology, which has not been captured in the confessional views, right. than you would have on a lot of the other stuff that's lower down there. And so 
those are the I hope those those definitions for the must believe, should believe, may believe. I hope I hope that's a helpful divider. I don't know if you disagree about how to break that down. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I agree. Well, let's go ahead and um, start landing the plane. Any final thoughts for this episode on unity and theological maximalism and civic covenanting and ecclesiastical covenanting? What, any, any final words for us? I think that the main thing people need to walk away with is realizing if we want to see a civil unity where we've got a Christian state, what you need to do is you need to be encouraging discussion with people um, where there's a desire to gather around a civil covenant. We have to covenant to do these things first and to protect each other first before we're going to be able to accomplish it. Unless we have a duty in place with defined duties, we're not going to be able to, to accomplish the goal. Um, so the commitment to do it um, and then the gathering around and fulfilling those commitments. In order to see that happen, we need to see churches concerned about ecclesiastical unity as well. And so we need to have a concern for that. We need to be praying for it. Um, the the unity of the church is something that powerfully encourages evangelism. Uh, the the love of the church powerfully encourages evangelism. Christ promises that those things cause the world to repent and to be convicted. And so if we maintain the law of God carefully, and if we seek unity in terms of the forms that we have, those things allow us to have a common voice. And mm-hmm. so the, the three to 10 million you know, Calvinists in America should be seeking to unify in that way and we would see a growth. And so that idea of seeking to figure out what's the high watermark to gather around um, and debating those differences. So I really think Presbyterians and Baptists are the guys that are generally, most of the believers are Presbyterian or Baptist. Right. And so there needs to be a focus on discussing those things in the context of a civil covenant where we're discussing coming to those things and and, and coming to agreement about these things to have a shared Confession, debating about baptism, debating about church government are very important for us to eliminate the practical dividers that prevent us from having a shared church. Then, in addition to that, you need to, the most practical thing for you to do is for you to make sure your home is in good order, where you're, you're leading well, you're leading your family and family worship, making sure they're church, you know, having stable church attendance, keeping the Sabbath, building up an estate, making sure you and your wife are a good mm-hmm. team, that you have resources, and making it so that you've got stuff that you can pour into this. Because if you don't have resources, you can't do any of this work. Right. And, and, and if, if you're a pastor and you're not bivocational, you're, you're probably in a, a church that's larger <laughs> in a lot of cases than it, than it should be, and relying upon that to feed the growth. The, the reality is that... The, Solid men can run their house, run their estate, and be public officers. And so the ability to do all of that stuff and build out a robust estate so you can leave an inheritance to your children and your children's children, that's necessary to make it so you've got the resources to do what you need. George Washington was able to march a 1,000 men at his own expense to the relief of Boston when it was under siege by the British. One of my goals is to make sure I could march a 1,000 men to Dallas to come to your guys' relief if there Mm -hmm. were need. And so that idea of trying to pull together that sort of utility, the capacity to actually do stuff, having right. resources to make things happen. And so if you want to do that, you have to govern yourself well. And the only mm-hmm. way to not be enslaved to sin is to have a deep knowledge of the truth. It makes it so that you're a father in the faith. If you have a knowledge of God that's deep, if you have a knowledge of God that's deep, then you govern yourself because it's the knowledge of the truth that sets men free from slavery to sin. And so I want to encourage men to seek the knowledge of God deeply and to make sure they're exercising discipline in all the areas of life, seeing their piety not just be an internal thing that's about a relationship between them and God, but it pushes out to the edges, their duty over their sphere. So I think that's the capacity to see unity occur. It is to know God deeply yourself, govern your home well and have resources, encourage your church to grow in depth and to encourage unity between other churches by discussing the differences and seeking to covenant together, and by seeing that occur in the civil sphere, having leaders and having Christian men throughout the country who are who are committed to seeing the acknowledgement of the reign of Christ over the state, having them covenant together, and having these necessary components work in harmony. Amen. Well said. Well, thank you, Mr. Reese, for coming on the show, and we will talk more Uh, in the near future, Lord willing. And thank you to the listener for tuning in. We hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, We want to, we want both. We want our cake and eat it too, um, because we think that's what the Lord wants. We want uh, incredible unity and covenant with, uh, with one another. um, And we also don't want to lower the bar. We want a theological maximalism 
and unity. I think that's what Ephesians 4 is. Ephesians 4 is not just talking about kumbaya love while everybody has a different position, a different conviction. Um, and I don't think Ephesians 4 is saying, yep, we'll attain the full stature of the maturity of Christ. Um, and by the time we get there, there'll only be three of us. I just, I reject both of the, that's just, that's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture is saying, um, high bar and, uh, and that we're all going to make it. We're going to make it. Um, so no man left behind and high bar. And, uh, that's, I think that's a lot of what I've, as I've gotten to know you, I think that's a lot of what you have uh, been giving yourself to, um, outside of the local level, as you try to be a voice to the church at large is, uh, don't lower the bar, uh, but also, um, let's team up. Let's agree. So God bless you for that ministry. And I hope it's helpful for the listener and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in.